Welcome to Startup to Storefront, presented by Ourobora. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Toast It. Thanks so much for joining. We're here to talk about your Shark Tank story, what happened after, the beginning of the company. For people who don't know, what is Toast It? What's the company? First of all, thank you for inviting us, Diego. Um, we're super excited to be here, and we're, we're fans of your podcast. I'll try to be as quick as I can. So Toast It is a brand of Better For You Latin American food staples. We first started out by basically trying to fulfill a personal need. We moved to the States about seven and eight years ago, respectively, and started our corporate careers here um, and just started noticing how we were missing sort of a little bit of our culture or our traditions that we had when we lived back home in Venezuela. One of them being eating arepas every day. Arepa, it's basically like, like a corn uh, flour bread that typically Venezuelans and a lot of other South Americans eat daily almost. And it's typically made from scratch, but it can take up to 20 minutes to make. So when we moved to the States and we had, you know, this hectic lifestyles and corporate corporate careers, we found ourselves losing this tradition and just started innovating with recipes and started thinking how we could bring this product in a really convenient way, but also using really great ingredients and keeping the recipe as traditional and as, as close to the real thing as we could. And so that's how everything started in our own kitchen and, you know, it evolved into what it is today. For people who don't know, arepas are delicious. I recommend anyone to try them. Um, this is story. It's, sto- it's so funny. The story you guys are sharing. If you guys remember Junea from from Brazi Bites, similar story, also on Shark Tank. She was on our podcast too. Where like the pan de queso from Brazil, she just wanted to bring it back and you know bring that culture to the United States. Which I, I love the mission. I love when entrepreneurs when it's like bigger than just a business. It's like there's a part of home that they're just trying to share with the world. Did you guys have any background in CPG? Or in food where you were like, okay, this kind of makes sense? Yeah, I I actually worked at PepsiCo for almost five years. I started out uh, leading financial planning for one of their first direct-to-consumer brands and then went on to lead uh, finance revenue management for their beverage business in the Southeast. My sister was more focused in marketing and consumer insights within the banking industry. But yes, we did have some experience. And when we first launched our our first products and started selling through e-commerce, I was able to identify that our repeat rates were were really uh, interesting by my knowledge of the industry. And that's when basically we decided to invest more more and more time on the business. And we found out that we really had something special. That's interesting. So you guys are you guys are like the dream team. Yes. But that said, um, just to add to Mafia's background, well, she did have a lot of background on CPG, but at the same time, and I think you would agree, Mafe, when you start something on your own, it's a completely different story. You you start with limited resources, just learning every day about production, about so many things that you don't even know exist when you work in corporate. And so that's what makes it very interesting and at the same time, really difficult. <laughs> yeah. What was the uh, the first product? So obviously you can do arepas, you can do a whole variety of them. And so what was like the what was the one the one you went to market with, or the one maybe you just made for your small group of friends and family to test to see if the recipe was right? So our initial product was the arepas. Um, we started out with two skews. Our, our original traditional recipe, the one that you would eat uh, in Venezuela and in most of South America. And then we decided to innovate a little bit with a second version, which had chia and flax seeds. A lot of people love them. They're very on trend. So that was our second product. And then we moved on to our third arepa version, the yuca and cheese arepa. It has real yuca root, uh, white Latin American cheese. It's, it's delicious and one of our best sellers. And then we moved on to pan de bonos which if you're familiar, are traditional Colombian cheese bread. They're also super popular in the U.S. So we thought it'd be a great a great way to move towards a second product line and possibly continue growing our, our, products, our products, not only to be arepas, but more a Latin American food brand. You said something earlier where you guys started as an e-commerce business. Was the play to always sort of try to dominate the e-commerce space or did you realize you'd have to be CPG also? But obviously e-commerce is a lot better, a lot easier. The margins are better than, uh, and then the, the uh, eventual valuation of the business is bigger. But how, 
what are you guys today? Are you still e-commerce? Is it CPG? Is it a hybrid? So no, we, we actually started with direct to consumer because we were that small, right? So, I mean, I'm actually really proud to say that we started out very small. We started in our own kitchens, cooking ourselves. Eventually we were able to hire help. And then when we saw that the business was actually picking up, um, we saw that the repeat rates were really great and there were some interest, real interest from retailers is when we were able to migrate into a more industrialized system. But we do believe that when you look at consumer behavior, it is more, uh, I guess, some more established consumer behavior to actually go to the retailers to do your grocery shopping for the week, more so than buying for groceries online still. We know that there's a population that buys their groceries online, but it's still limited uh, compared to the percentage of people that are still going to the stores. Although we do believe that it's an interesting venue to explore and, and have your direct-to-consumer channel to educate the consumer and have um, you know the option to buy from there if there's anyone that wants to explore your brand and try out your products. Right now, we are the great majority of our sales are coming from retail and, do, and we do believe that it's a faster way to scale. And at some point, where do you guys get the idea to go to Shark Tank? Is the, do you guys get approached by them? Or are you guys seeing it on TV? You're just a fan. What was the moment you were like, I think we should apply to Shark Tank? Well, we've always been fans of the of the show, of course. I think it's for both of us, it has been a great avenue for understanding how businesses work in the US, how they can scale, how ex- important exposure is and contacts, et cetera, as to you know, or compared to what our experience was living in Venezuela and, you know, founding and, and, and managing businesses there, which is so different. I just want to remind people that we've only been living here for seven years. So it has been a bit of a learning curve and everything is so different. But the show has been great for us to educate ourselves as far as how to found and, and grow a business. At some point, I'm going to say we're part of one of those communities uh, around CPG in the U.S. that are so great. And someone shared a link to apply to the show. And we were like, well, let's let's go ahead and try. You know, we we never know what might happen. We didn't have great expectations because it's so competitive. But we just went ahead and, and you know, applied for the show with our best intentions, with without so many expectations and you know, be careful what you wish for, because eventually we passed and passed auditions until they finally gave us a green light. That's amazing. And how long after your company was started, did you guys get on the show? So we first started selling in 2020. So it was three years after we we first started. I want to ask you this just personally. And so I was born in Peru. You guys are from Venezuela. There's a part of, I think, at least for me, when I moved to America, I just thought like, oh my God, like you can do anything here. I really felt like that because politically you're in a safe environment. Capital wise, you realize like you can kind of do anything. There's no real rules or in the sense of like, there's no one holding you back, right? It's just up to you. When you guys moved here, did you did you always have the ambition to start a company? Did you feel like the environment was just so different when compared to South America, Venezuela, that you, it just felt like a different part of you could sort of explore this creativity of business. What were your like the, your personal journeys into that? In my case, it definitely was. I do believe that there are some certain constraints in South America to start a business. To your point before about accessing capital or even certain, I guess, limitations when it comes to how uh, seriously people could take you in certain countries. It certainly is in Venezuela. You know, we're too young women um, at the time, you know, at, at some point during our, our journey, we were both pregnant too, which could also, you know, seem like a limitation or sort of like a deterrent for some people to invest. So I certainly felt like this was a, a, a great place to innovate, to be creative. And I felt like, you know, really the sky is the limit. Shows like this also helped us a lot. We listen to a lot of entrepreneurship podcasts where you can listen to stories of a lot of really inspirational people that, you know, aren't necessarily the people that you would think would start businesses that are very, you know, successful, which are typically like people who went to certain, you know, universities or had a certain background or had certain backing, Uh, you know, were immigrants that came here, women and 
we were able to identify ourselves and see our stories reflected on some of the entrepreneurs that started businesses and were really successful, you know, people in la later stages of life or people that didn't have the, the specific business background and, and being so successful, right? So we felt inspired and felt like we could also do it too. Yeah. Let's talk about your Shark Tank experience. And so before you get on the show, did you do a lot of preparation in terms of who you wanted to land a deal with, who you were hoping to land a deal with? Did you know there would be a guest shark? If Did you know who it would be? So to give, give us a window into the prep maybe the day before and then ultimately to, to when you like get on air and, you, and you're standing there in front of them before you're about to record and pitch. Okay, so yes, we did a lot of preparation ahead of the show. So first of all, we started preparing months in advance, even when you know we were going through the first stages of the auditions until we finally were given a green light. When they finally told us, you know, you're coming to LA, here are the, you know, here are your tickets. We made a very extensive list of questions of what typically gets asked during the program and, you know, answered each one of them, made, made sure we were really prepared to answer each one of the questions. Um, and then sometime ahead of the program, we were actually told who our guest shark was going to be. We were actually very, very excited and actually prepared even more questions that were more tailored to his background, his businesses, et cetera, because we really, really wanted to close the deal with him. And so, yes, and you, you need to prepare because you don't know how your nerves are going to respond and how well you're going to respond at, at the time. So as much preparedness as you can have, I think it, it always it's going to help. To our surprise, I think he was sympathetic from the beginning. I think he was able to see something in us because he was also an immigrant. And I'm, I'm talking about Daniel Lubetsky, which we eventually close to deal with, uh, who's a founder of Kind. And so we were very lucky in that sense that he was very sympathetic and understood the business from the beginning and was actually not as tough as we thought he was going to be. We prepared some really, really tough questions and made sure, you know, we were able to answer in, in the right way. Um, so, yes, we, we prepared a lot and, and practiced the pitch extensively until even one of us lost, lost her voice. And so we had to stop rehearsing at that time. I know a couple things they always touch on, and obviously Mark Cuban in the room is always in the better for you category, right? And so he always wants the the low carb option of the thing. And so you guys checked that box, which I thought was was great. And then when it came to, I don't know if anyone's ever asked you this, but so you can choose at some point, basically Kevin O'Leary is on the table and so is Daniel. And so you have Mr. Wonderful and you have the founder of Kind, who you know can help you guys out. Me Mexican-American, legend of a human Wow. What was <laughs> internally, what were you guys thinking when you have to make the decision, you know, like who, who do you marry? You know, it was like the bachelor. It was like, were you guys thinking at all about Kevin or was it, was it simply Daniel's our guy? I think, you know, going into the show, we'd already, we already knew that we really, really wanted to close a deal with him if we could, if he was okay. interested. Um, of course, there's always what's actually going to happen in reality and who's actually going to be interested in your business. And then you have to really assess who's best for your business out of the people that are showing interest, right? And I think at that point, we might have considered, but since we knew because of his background, because he's also an immigrant, he was able to build a business from scratch, which is also what we're trying to do. It's so much knowledge that is invaluable that we could gain from partnering with him that we were really, really interested in working with him. So at that point, I don't think it was really a question. But yes, and, and to my sister's point before, when we were working, you know, in corporate and had some sort of experience in CPG, yes, that is true. But when you try to extrapolate that into building your business from scratch, there are so many differences, even from, you know, starting a brand from zero with limited resources when you start to really craft what you're going to try to do and where to invest your money to gain, you know, brand awareness and try to build your brand, you're talking about building a brand with millions of dollars in a budget when you're coming from a corporate standpoint from building something with so, so little. And so the, the, I think the skill set um, and the, the tool set, ha it's completely different, right, from building something from a corporate standpoint. And not only that, it's also, you know, negotiating with retailers when you're such a small brand that you don't have that much money to put into promoting your, your products. It's also 
you know, dealing with co-packers when you're such a small brand and balancing having healthy margins with trying to introduce your product to the to the market and offer competitive pricing, right? Even though uh, the margins we know aren't um, that high until you're able to reach uh, economies of scale. So it's, it's a different uh, tool set that you need, and it's hard to gain that from a corporate career or even corporate mentors. So we, we really knew that we could really benefit from, from having this, this type of partnership. And did the deal go through ultimately after the show? Yes. So we, we're actually still in um, negotiating, um, in the negotiating process, but we've already went through the due diligence process and, and are still trying to close the deal. That's awesome. Have you, have you learned, like, obviously it's, it's sort of fresh, but have you learned anything from him or has he given you guys any advice uh, since the show that, you know, you really value? He actually has. So without having closed the deal yet, uh, which we're still in, in the process of, of doing, we've been in, in three calls with him already and he's already shared insights and recommendations on what we should do, re, you know, regarding the show airing and how we should capitalize on the extra awareness, et cetera, et cetera, as far and, and other items related to the business uh, that he's interested in exploring. What did you guys see just from a sales perspective after you guys aired? It's pretty significant. You know, as far as e-commerce, I could say it's more than a 10,000% increase. Uh, We're already seeing like over 100% increase in some of our retailers. So it is pretty significant and it's only been, you know, some like I think 12 days since our show aired. Wow. That's pretty amazing. That's huge. Yes. Yeah, Thank you mo- so much. most of the companies we've spoken to, I think the range I've heard has been something like between eighty to two hundred thousand. Obviously, there's a huge range in in product, but um, that's been like the the numbers, which has been amazing. And so, where are you guys now in terms of trying to capitalize on the moment? What stores are you in now? Uh, where can people find you guys? So we're available in about five hundred public stores in the Southeast. We're also available at um, Walmart stores in the Southeast, Whole Foods in Florida, and Winn-Dixie in the Southeast as well. Uh, You can find us in the international frozen food section uh, in all of these retailers. As far as, you know, plans for the future, we're, of course, really interested about exploring new regions because we're very focused in the Southeast. And that was of course, very strategic because of our target demographic. But Mm -hmm. there's also a lot of Hispanic people living in other uh, regions in the U.S. that we're really interested in exploring and also exploring new product innovations that we think are missing from the market. I think that's Hmm. very close to what we are, which is exploring staples that have kind of been lost into the culture here or people, you know, immigrating from from Latin America to the U.S. and have lost some of these traditions and staples that they were used to eating back at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're trying to innovate and bring this to the market. Do you have a hint or something you're working on, like a special dish, a special treat maybe that uh, we can we can see coming up from your brand? We're actually really excited about a new product that's coming in. Uh, we're launching in very soon in, a, in about a couple of months. It has plantain. So we're really excited about that. I, I know plantain is very popular in Latin America and in the Caribbean. And, you know, we love plantain. This is actually one of our abuela's recipes that we used to eat around Christmas time. And we think, uh, we think it's going to do great. And it's something that we've never seen in, in the shelves before. Wow. All right. So for people listening who are probably going to go to the store and buy your product, what happens? So I go to the store, I'm in the international food section. I buy it. I bring it home. Is it air fryer? How do I cook it? You can use an air fryer. You can use a toaster oven, your regular oven, even a you know frying pan. You can, you can basically heat it up anywhere um, and you don't have to wait until it's thawed or anything. You can just take it directly from the freezer okay. and place it on your air fryer or whatever, whatever it is you have five minutes and and they're ready. And is it gluten-free also? What are they? They're all gluten-free. Okay. All of our products are gluten-free. They have no sugar, no sugar added, no preservatives, um, and made with, with really great ingredients. I love it. Well, listen, tell people where they can find you on Instagram. Obviously you mentioned the stores before, but where, where can they support you and the brand? Thank you. Yeah. So you can follow us at toasted foods on Instagram and, and most social media channels. Our handles are the same at Toasted Foods. 
and we we hope you're able to find us and and support us and find us in the stores too we'd love you guys to to try out the products well congratulations on the success congratulations on the show congratulations on having a baby that's amazing good for you thank i know that's you. a lot thank you so much and it's yes. just really it's nice to see a south american sisters do this thing new mothers females founders so an inspiration to all i really appreciate you coming on the podcast thank you thank you diego thank you for the invite thank you so much for the support and making it to the end of the episode if you haven't already please leave a review and share the episode with your friends if you never want to miss a beat on all things entrepreneurship make sure to follow us on socials for daily content see you next tuesday for another great episode